welcome to the XY Advisor podcast, where it's our goal to help you become the best financial advisor possible and drive the positive evolution of financial advice. Hey guys, Ben Nash from the XY Advisor crew and I'm super pumped to be introducing this brand new series we're about to kick off all around the three P's of Plan Produce Profit. Now, the XY team spent a lot of time thinking about what makes a great financial advice offering, a great financial advice business and what we distilled it down to was that there are three key elements that you need to get right to have any level of success in your financial planning business. The first is about planning and how to plan an epic service proposition that's engaging for the people people that you want to work with and compelling to drive real results within your business. The second is about producing and that's about being efficient in your business, streamlining things, uh, being, you know, maximizing the benefits of technology to uh, run a, a scalable and uh, profitable advice service. And then the third is profit, which is all about getting your message out to a bigger market. Uh, how, how do you attract more people into this awesome offer that you're running efficiently and scalably? So so uh, I'm taking over over the next 15 episodes. We're going to have 15 advisors, going to be 100% advisors. I've had a bunch of fun with the recordings that I've done so far, the interviews, and, uh, and I've got a few more great ones to come. So uh, I hope you enjoy this series. As you scale your advice business, are you frustrated with the amount of compliance, paperwork, and staffing issues? Virtual Business Partners specializes in helping financial services firms in four areas, admin, power planning, bookkeeping, and marketing. Virtual business partners work with you to get your business offshore ready. This includes identifying what tasks need to be done locally and what functions can be managed offshore. Advisors find they can reduce back office costs by between 50 and 75% and significantly improve their task turnaround times. For more information, go to virtualbusinesspartners.com.au. So, uh, so I was thinking about how I was going to introduce you when uh, when I was walking around this morning, and uh, Pulp Fiction is like my favourite movie. Yeah, familiar. What am I, Mister Blue? Mister Pink? That, no, Mister Blue. <laughs> oh. <laughs> from the dancing scene. So, uh, mate, Vincenzo, thank you very much for joining us. Mate. Thank you, Ben. It's good to be here. here. It's been a little while since we've been together in the studio, but uh, it is. You know, absence makes the heart grow fonder, it does. as they say. And we don't have Clayton eating his hamburger next to us today either. <laughs> Or Anzac biscuits, or uh, <laughs> yes. Yeah, so uh, yeah, keeping it fresh today. Good, yes. mate. Um, so for anyone living under a rock that uh, that doesn't know the the man machine that is Vince Scully, a mm-hmm. um, couple of quick ones. So your business, Life Sherpa, been yep. going since. Well, two, um, 2014 we got our license, but we really didn't launch till 2016. So it's coming up on our third anniversary. Cool, won a swag of awards. Uh, a little bit quiet since then, been focusing on uh, making the dollars, which uh, I'm sure we'll chat a little bit bit more about uh, today. But so 20, 2014 license, 2016 kickoff, what's your team look like? Uh, we are, well, it depends on your measure, but we are four in the actual team and a bunch of peripherals. So we've got a couple of development guys in the Ukraine. We've got a social media agency and uh, I've got a guy who does our videos. So I guess that's five and a half FTEs when you add it all up. Cool. And how many advisors? But that's where the four came from. Four. Yep. So, four. so that, that's broking, coaching and advisors. Yep. And so, okay, so you, you sort of preempted one of my questions. So you do financial advice, mortgage broking, and coaching. So about a third of our revenue comes from home loans, about a third from insurance, meaning life insurance products, and the balance from subscriptions, coaching, training courses. Cool. So very tech focused one. We're going to talk. Uh, we'll talk a bit more about that. Um, tell me, uh, ha- how much time do you spend working on your business? Well, how much? Well, how much? All of it. Work? <laughs> All of it. <laughs> <laughs> right. Standard um, week. Yeah, we, I tend not to do too many weekends, although I do spend a lot of reading and listening to podcasts and watching YouTube on the weekend. Um, yeah, that's no, a standard, pretty well a standard five-day week. Um, 
they're not as long a days as I did in investment banking, but they're not nine to five either. Right. Yes. Very good. And uh, revenue. Right. Um, we are about to close. We've just closed off the books, and subject to the audit, we cracked one point two million for FY nineteen. Cool. Up from six fifty. Can't remember what the audit account said, but they're about for oh. FY eighteen. <laughs> so um, it's a sign that we've sort of turned the turn the corner. And it's um, a big fucking turn. Yeah, but you know when you draw, you start off and do these business plans, and you draw these beautiful hockey stick graphs, and you think, "Well, that will never happen." And then you find yourself on the upward part of the curve. Yes. And you can actually feel it when you walk into the office every day. You can actually feel that today's better than yesterday. The energy is there, but it takes a long time to get to that point. Yes. And that's the, it's the perseverance to get there. I think is the, the bit that differentiates. A successful business from a not from a not so successful for sure yeah i know that uh well you've been at this a long time too yeah I, well we, we started 2015 and i was going to say that it is well i sort of at the start wanted to stay small so i i always thought yeah it'd be just me to help clients and be just me uh and i realized that unless i want to go insane from uh trying to do everything myself that uh, work 100 hours a week forever that you sort of need a team uh, around you to do that but it is it's funny that you spend you know you spend so much time you're doing all these little things like you did doing the profile do the things yeah. get out there um, build build all these efficiencies in the business build on the service work on the service build your content build your lead magnets do all the hooks and then uh, yeah one thing clicks and then opportunities lead to opportunities yeah. lead to opportunities lead to opportunities so mate I am super keen to get into the uh, into what's actually driven that growth, but just uh, last question to wrap on the on the business. Um, what's your what's your ideal client, and what is it that you deliver for them? Our ideal, well, our typical client is a twenty nine year old female in a creative or professional job, and she wakes up on her twenty ninth birthday and says, "You know, I make a lot of money. How come I got nothing to show for it?" And the answer is, in a lot of time, it's in her wardrobe and. <laughs> And, I'm, you know, that's not being sexist. It's just 75% of our members are female. It wasn't necessarily designed in, but it's more the way it happened. Yeah. And I think it's probably a reflection on younger Australians where women are taking taking the initiative. And the approach of 30 is a very powerful motivator. Do you think it's that they're taking the initiative though, or do you think it's just that blokes think that they should be able to do everything themselves? Because my vote is for the latter. Yeah, there's probably some of that. Um, you know, the old joke about guys not asking for directions, which is made worse by Google Maps. <laughs> um, so, yeah, there's probably an element of that. But, you know, there's nobody more motivated to lose weight or save money than a woman who's just got engaged. Mm. And so I think that flows into the rest of our lives as well, whether that's buying a house, um, saving for a wedding or saving to go overseas. All those things are um, precipitated by that. I think it's often 25 for guys, but 30 for girls in particular. Big number. It's yeah. a big number. Yeah. Yeah, it's an interesting one. I find that in uh, in our business, and not a too dissimilar sort of target market, although ours are probably five years or so later than, than your ideal client, but um, definitely a lot of females and and then um, couples. But it's typically driven by the female, so they're the ones saying we should we've got to get our shit together. Yeah. Uh, we're getting married. We want to have a family. Or we want to buy that house or whatever. Not always, uh, but. We, you know, I could probably, I, you know, we've only got less, just, uh, just on probably seventy-five clients. I could probably count on one hand a number of single male clients, and not on one hand, mm-hmm. on two hands, I could probably count a number of single male clients that uh, that were just engaged with us as single males and not come in as part of a partnership or or whatever. So yeah, I think um, for guys, often it is the coupling part of the equation that triggers a lot of that. Uh, desire to do something. You know, we all talk about um, coupling, nesting and parenting as being the three events that drive the equation. Yep. And 
the woman is often the driver of each of those three decisions. <laughs> yes, this is uh, yeah true. We need we often need a push to get our shit together. So uh, yeah, totally understand. And so uh, actually, I think probably a relevant one for you for anyone that does isn't familiar with your business. So what? How many clients do you have? Uh, well, we put about six and a half thousand people through through the platform in one form or another. And that doesn't mean they've all paid money. Um, but the vast bulk of those will have done some of our, use some of our tools like our money personality test or our financial freedom factor quiz. And so they've gone away with some form of improvement to their, um, their financial position. Some of those will then move on and, you know, get their super sorted or sort their insurance or refinance their home loan or get a home loan or do our budgeting course. Um, so they're not all financial planning clients in the traditional sense. A lot um, of tech, a lot of yeah. uh, education. It is, it's a largely driven around behaviour, psychology and education. Yeah. Um, and if you get those right, they it sort of flows through to the rest of it. Yes. And the rest of it being uh, yeah. home loans, insurance, super. So if you think about someone who's between 28 and 33, you know, 28 is the average age of first marriage. 31 is the average age of first home buyers. I thought you were going to say 31 is the average age of second marriage. Or something <laughs> like that's a quick transition. And 31 is the, um, the average age for first child. So you go through that period, those five years from 28 to 35, and it's your peak period for, for debt because you're buying your first Huh? Yeah. It's your peak period for protection because you've got most of your career ahead of you and you've just taken a huge loan and had a kid. Yeah. And they're largely ignored by the industry. I know. It's, it's, uh, yeah, it's a shame. Good for us, though. It is. <laughs> um, there just needs to be more of us. Yeah, for sure. Well, mate, you're doing your bit with six and a half thousand yeah. people. I think that's a, that's a pretty good knock. So, Cool. So tell us, tell us a bit about the, the journey. And actually, I was thinking about this before. So we've obviously, uh, got, well, met each other around the traps, but then, uh, did some stuff through the XY mastermind when that was going for, uh, for sort of pushing almost, we almost got to two years, I think, before it fell apart. Yeah. That's cool. Um, but, uh, I, I'm not sure I know the answer to this one in terms of what was the transition in? Because clearly, like, so we're talking, this is for the plan produced profit series. So we're talking yep. about how you, and out your business and service offering and, and with six and a half uh, thousand people going through your system, clearly you're doing something right. Um, but what was the – tell us about this, the, the journey to get there, why, you, why, you, why you've done what you've done and, uh, yeah, what the yeah, – well, yeah, I mean, the journey began in the aftermath of the GFC, I'd sold my previous advice business to Mark Boris in December 2007. And um, then obviously a year later, 2008 happened. And um, it was good time. Thank you, Mr. Boris. Um, unfortunately, there was a few less zeros than Alan Bond got. Um, <laughs> but the multiple was good. Um, but I was obviously had a lot of time on my hands. And I'm sitting there and thinking, you know, this financial planning stuff, it's not rocket science, it's not a black art. There must be a pattern to all this. So I actually sat down on paper um, (laughs) and built this algorithm that said, well, this is how you produce advice. And it's actually, you you can get the the questions right and it gives you a set of outcomes. Now, you need to take some simplifying assumptions there, Mm. which is why we sort of say, well, look, if if you've got a ton of money to invest, or you've got a family trust or a self-managed super fund or you run an incorporated business, you don't really fit the life shaper model. Yeah. But if you take your typical 20, 30, 40-something PAYG employee um, going through the usual life cycle, most of them are mostly the same. Agreed. Now, obviously, they're all different in their own way. Of course. But most of them are mostly the same. So when you get the same set of circumstances, you should get the same outcome. And that's what I set out to, to document. And that was all, I guess, an academic exercise back in 2000 and, 
nine, eight, nine, nine. So 2009, 10. Yeah. Um, in fact, funny you should mention that. Um, last week, I finally wound up the last company in that group. It's taken me almost a decade to wow. un- unwind that business. Nice. Um, but yes, yeah, so having that time, I sort of sat and documented this. And I thought, well, that's in- interesting, but the tech really wasn't there to implement it. Yes. And I hadn't actually worked out how you turn that into something that people are prepared to pay for. Mm. So it sat in my bottom drawer for quite some time and, you know, life moved on. I was doing a whole bunch of work with other advisors and brokers and fund managers around compliance and licensing. And then in 2014, the idea really hit me that I said, well, if you look at the Australian population, we've got eight and a half million households or so, and less than 20% of them have a financial advisor, which, well, it depends on who you listen It's somewhere between 10 and 20%. Um, yeah. I'm not sure anyone really knows the answer. Mm. But only 20% of households have more than $100,000 of non-super investments. So that's about 2 million households. And there's 19,000 financial advisors. So that's about 100 each. Yeah. Which is, yeah, it's a pretty good business. Yeah. You know, 100 people, $100,000 more to invest. You can make a really nice living on that. Mm. But what about the rest of them? Yeah. And there's another 2 million are largely existing on government benefits. So a fair chunk of those are age pensioners and a fair chunk of those are, um, you know, on New Start or disability or whatever other Mm -hmm. benefits, which leaves a sort of a four... Four million households that are just largely being ignored. Who can benefit? They've got the money to benefit from. They've got the assets to benefit, but they're not investing a hundred thousand dollars. Yeah. So if and you don't quite have the money to benefit from, oh well, to benefit and pay five thousand yeah. dollars for a financial plan as well. But there's still a whole bunch of benefit that they can get from having a financial plan, and. And that was where the penny dropped. Because if you look at that group, that four million households, if you you know, just take the ones that are under forty five and are in PAYG, that gets you to about one point eight million households. Yeah. And what are they doing? They're going through these three life cycles. They're at their peak demand for um for debt and protection. And it's the time to get your super on its right starting point. And yet we as an industry, by charging AUM fees, can't service them. Mm. And so what do they need? Well, they need help with home loans, insurance, um, budgeting, paying off their debts, uh, dealing with preparing for private school fees, buying, upgrading, all those sort of things. Um, but how do you charge for them? And so the solution that we came up with was saying, well, there's a whole bunch of this stuff that we can have the machine do. So by diagnosing, triaging, and educating and taking people through a journey and then reserving the expensive human bit for when you really need it. So take life insurance, for example, or income protection insurance. Um, It's relatively easy to teach a machine to go, well, here's how much you need. And probably not much harder to go, well, therefore you should buy this company's policy. Yes. But the bit from there to actually paying your first premium, Mm. when you go through the underwriting and you get an exclusion or a loading, and almost everyone under 30 gets a mental health exclusion. Yeah, yeah. So, Yeah, so So you get to that point and most people unaided will go, that's too hard. Yeah. And, or and, nah, give me a discount. Give yeah. me a discount for the uh, for the exclusion. I see it all the yeah. time. Oh, they're going to exclude it. I should get it for cheaper. Yeah, it doesn't work. Say, either. unfortunately, no. So you get to that point and left to most people's devices, they will go, that's too hard. I'm going to stop now. And that's where you need the human. So you can't really solve this analog problem with a pure digital solution. What you need to be able to do is enable the human to be there at the right time 
So what they're doing, what the advisor's doing is advice. It's not education. It's not sales. It's not technical. It's guiding and coaching people through that yeah, process. Absolutely. And for that, you need a real human. For now, at least. Well, I, I think it always will. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, and so in order to be able to deliver this solution, what we said, what we need to do is be able to get the machine to do the, the expensive high-volume stuff which is getting them to the point of, I need this. Yeah. So they've sort of made a buying decision. I need a home loan or I need I need to sort this income protection stuff out. And at that point, then you bring the real advisor in and you provide the tools for the advisor to do that efficiently. So you can't, that's the diff, that's why I never like the term robo advice. Yeah. Um, I mean, most robo advice is in fact, Automated asset allocation and portfolio management. Mm. Very little of it's advice. Yes, exactly. Uh, that's not to say it doesn't have a place, but it's not advice. Yes, and it's just a decision tree. That's right. So, yeah, and that the real value we as advisors add in that equation is the behavioural piece. Yes, and the motivation and and pushing them to, yeah. to get through and get the thing done, whatever the thing is. And Siri will never do that. <laughs> So that was the, the the sort of plan, and then when we set out how to actually implement that, mm. and um, the key to that was really about focusing on the really expensive bits about delivering advice, and the two really expensive bits are obviously people, and the bit that most people forget is the cost of getting the customer in the first place. Um, and a lot of that gets lost because we get most of our work, so we, meaning financial planners generally, get most of our work by referrals or mm. um, sort of non-paid marketing, but it still costs. Um, I, mean, I always reckon that my previous business, it cost me nearly $20,000 to onboard a new customer. Now, which was about a year's fee, because right. they, they were all, you know, 65 and had a million dollars in self-made super. Yeah. So you could afford to spend $20,000 bringing them on board. But that was all from referrals. And I was converting two out of three of them. Yeah. But by the time you, you know, you, you have a couple of meetings, you review their existing portfolio, you produce a bit of advice, and then try and engage them, mm. that's a lot of time. And when you add it all up, and divided by the your conversion rate, that was costing me twenty thousand mm. dollars, which is okay when the customer is generating twenty thousand dollars of fees a year. Yeah, or ideally something. something yeah, um, because you only do it once, and you hopefully keep them for thirty years. Yeah, um, but when you're looking at you know, a thirty year old who's not engaged, mm. because these sixty five year olds were all about to retire. Yes. Which is a huge right. mind focuser. <laughs> yeah. You know, my God, I've got to live on this. Turning off the income tap. Yes. Uh, and so we needed a way of engaging at a cost effective way. And that's really where all those upfront tools come in. But that's about taking people through a journey where they realize what they need to do. So we effectively engage. Diagnose, triage, advice. Sure. Mate, uh, you know, I mentioned this series is all about plan, produce, and profit, which is, you know, planning a compelling service proposition, producing efficiently, and, and uh, getting a message to the masses. And uh, it's, I think it's fair to say that you, uh, you excel in all three. So I could have easily put you into, I, I could have easily sure. put you in for any, uh, any one of these, but. Um, I, I'm, I'm interested to, to talk today about more around the planning piece and how you actually planned out your, your service proposition. So, uh, and I, I think I should probably know that you're slightly underplaying uh, a couple of the things where you talk about, you know, just driving efficiencies, um, well, in, in your business and engagement that, you know, you've got the ability to, you're taking thousands of people through this journey. The offer is a, Ultra low cost for people that, that want to be yeah. at the tip of the iceberg, uh, which is how much, Mark? 
Fifteen dollars is our entry price. Fifteen bucks a month with the ability to then upsell yeah. to. So our, our our flagship is our budget bliss program, which is a two hundred ninety nine dollar course and a sixty dollar a month subscription. So that's yep. our flag. That's the entry, the gateway drug that we really want to get. <laughs> and that makes sense because you're getting people into good habits, and uh, and then it's easier yep. for you to help them. You can get them some results as yep. well. Give them a bit more money to do things like you know save from yep. home, buy the insurance. Um, whatever else, and then I know that you've got the ability to opt in then to these additional That's modules. right, yeah. So, so in, back on the planning stage, um, I probably went against everything you've ever read about a startup in terms of planning, about this fail, what's it, what's it move, move fast and break things, fail fast, all that stuff. Yeah. This was planned within an inch of its life. Right. Um, our, okay. our business plan is about 85 pages. Wow, And okay. there's a huge... Um, financial model that backs that up. Um, and it sort of turned out to be remarkably on the money. Um, but, you know, most people would say that's not how you start a startup. Yeah. I mean, we're sitting here in WeWork and, um, you know, this is full or stone and chalk around the corner. It's full of people with startups and there's common the advice most people will get is get, just get something out there and fail fast. Mm. Um, that's a little more difficult in financial services because obviously you've got to convince ASIC to give you a license. So you've got to give them a, <laughs> you've got to give them a, a, a financial forecast that shows you've got enough money to actually do what you say you're going to do and you're going to demonstrate that you can do it. And obviously people are a lot less tolerant of glitches and failures when you're dealing with their money. Of course. But... Um, in terms of that plan, so there was, I applied for the license in mid 2014, thinking it was going to take now a year to get it processed and I had plenty of time to get everything else done. Yeah. Um, as it turned out, it was turned around in a matter of months. And so the, Is that the same time? Um, I think it's probably more a reflection of the time. Um, I don't think they would turn around that quickly today. Yeah. Probably. Um, and certainly not when the accountant exemption process was mm. was going through. So the clock started on a lot of the expenses once the license was issued. You know, the PI, you've got audits. Yeah. Um, all those compliance costs just start chewing away. So we had to start peddling really fast. Well, well it wasn't we at that point. It was me. <laughs> <laughs> um, it the just, proverbial we, that's okay. That's right. I had to pedal pretty quickly. And... Um, so I built the the website through that period, and we had a an abortive start in 2015, uh, where we started with a, a freemium model, which said you get some all this stuff for free, and then you can sign up for the 15 and upgrade to the paid membership. Yeah, and that proved not to be a a winner. So that one, guess, was our fail fast moment. Right. And so oh, yeah. <laughs> so that then led us to a um a sort of a Netflix model, which was a thirty day free trial moving yeah. into the so you effectively got the paid service for thirty days. Sure. And um so, so I guess release two, which came in early twenty sixteen. And um we're about to release version four in the next week or so. Um which will also have a an unpaid tier, right? And it, yeah, okay. And so, because when because you you won uh, the IFA awards twenty fifteen, right? it was yeah. a finalist. I didn't actually win. Oh, okay, right. Yeah, that's where I saw your business for the first time. Yeah. I was like, holy shit! I was like, this is a- yeah. So, so twenty fifteen, um, and we also got the Reader's Choice Award at the Smart One Hundred that year, um, which to me was sort of more of an endorsement of the business model. And the IFA is an endorsement by your peers, which yeah. is hugely valuable and yeah, makes you feel like you're doing something good for the industry that's been good to me for so long. <laughs> um, but to get it from what's effectively the public yes, um, was, I think, a much bigger endorsement for us internally. Um, so yeah, that was sort of the big, the beginning. It's changed a lot since then, and um, most of those changes are around cementing this journey. Yeah. So 
when I rock up, when a customer rocks up at the the website, we need to create a a journey from. There's something slightly wrong. I don't quite know what's wrong with my finances, but I'm not get just not getting ahead. Yes. Um, to this is actually what you need to do because that could be for so many reasons. It could be uh, of I don't make enough. I've got too much debt. Um, Spending addiction. Yeah, it could be anything, and it's sort of the tools are around like helping the member on their journey to understanding why they do what they do with money and why they are where they are and where they want to go. Yeah. And then we're about helping them get there. And that journey could start with you know, some of our tools like a money personality test or a, um, you know, a freedom factor quiz, which gives you a score across eight elements of financial freedom, you know, starting with spend less than you're in and moving, <laughs> and moving up to invest in your surplus. And then, tips and tricks for how you can improve those scores, yeah. which through that process obviously leads you to real advice at some point. Yeah. And so, so um, you, you know, when you're, when you're actually planning out this model, so you're, you, launch, you launched out with, uh, you had your fail fast moment, and you, <laughs> launched, you launched out yep. with your 30-day free and then, a, and then an ongoing monthly subscription yep. where you can, what did you get for that? Well, for your $15, you get access to the tools on the website, which is really around this um, financial freedom factor quiz, which is... But it wasn't at that time, was it? Yeah, it was. Um, that's been there from the beginning. We did have a, a stripped-down version of it called a quick fix, um, which we've now... No quick fixes then. No, oh, there are no quick fixes. Than that. So <laughs> we, we've abandoned that one. Um but, yeah. but it's, I mean, the whole personality, values, goals, journey... Yeah, is the key to to all of this. So yeah, I mean, the look and feels changed. Um, but what did you get when you? So you? Oh, sorry, getting back to month, so you get, so you get you, yeah, so you get you access to all the tools. So you've got your yeah, the quiz is the core of that. There's a whole bunch of resources around it, um, yeah, articles and educational resources on the on the site, and it gets you access to an advisor to ask questions. So you can email in your, your advisor or your Sherpa and they will respond to your specific question. So anything that's general advice. Yeah, obviously. anything that's short of personal advice. Sure. And so so or short of anything that triggers the SOA requirement is probably a better way of describing it. Yes. Yeah, sure. And so you so you're paying fifteen bucks a month, you uh, you can Q and A with an advisor. And then the idea obviously from a business perspective, it's not all the fifteen bucks I'm sure is good, but uh, to then you're expecting people to opt in to say insurance and that's right so so as they're going through the quiz um, and doing the exercises that go with that so the eight steps for you know as interest you spend this in your own build an emergency stash pay off your debts get your super sorted prepare for the unexpected get your paperwork sorted buy and pay off your home and invest your surplus and Did you have the budget module when you first started? Uh, well, the, the budget module was there in a simple sense. It's now been sort of formalized into a, a, a course, which now has sort of I don't know, two and a bit hours of video and a whole bunch of tools that go with it. Yeah. Um, and, of course, we didn't have the budget tracking software. We had a, a one-on-one service using Zero Cashbook. Oh, yeah. For 200. Oh, yeah, I remember that. Yeah. Um, which we've now replaced with our um, – Google Sheet. So we've got a Google Sheet with bank feeds, um, which better... Google re- Sheet with bank feeds? Yeah. Very high-tech stuff. So, um, I mean, the whole... I guess I guess moving off track, but the, the concept of using a spreadsheet, um, there's a lot of evidence that says people who use a spreadsheet to track their money do a much better job of it. Mm. And people who use apps tend to overdraw their... Bank account more often than those who don't use apps. There you go. Um, and what we think is causing that is this concept of mindfulness that using an app like Pocketbook or Pocketsmith or Money Brilliant or Money Soft or I don't know, there's probably 30 of them by yeah. now. Um, and it sort of leads you into this sort of false sense of security because you ask someone who's got Pocketbook on their phone. Do you track your expenses? And they go, of course I do. I've got pocketbook. Yeah, I've got the um, app that tells me I've blown my budget yeah. every month. So how often do you actually look at it? And how often do you sit down and go, 
why did I spend that? What was I doing that yeah. made me spend that? So the mindfulness that your spreadsheet gives you, so you're actually looking at, I mean, it still works on your phone, but it's, yeah. it's, it's a spreadsheet. So by actually sitting down and think, so we send you an email every day which says, here's the new transactions we found. Here's all the ones you haven't categorized yet. Uh, log in and do it. And that mindfulness is what gives you a lot of the benefit. Yeah, but that was, a, that was so. That was a bit of a, a distraction. But where were we? Yeah, so talking talking about so the idea is that people pay fifteen dollars yeah. a month, and then they're, and then they're they're modulizing what you haven't mentioned, but is that you're you're all entirely fee and then you rebate. That's right. All so, the so and yeah. insurance commissions. Yeah, I mean describing the rebates is probably a little bit misleading. What we do is turn them into fixed fees. Mm. So we. Rather than charging the client a fixed fee and turning the commissions off, we actually take the commissions, deduct a fixed fee, and rebate the excess. Yes. Um, and people are net, typically net better off. Getting net refunds. Yeah. So anyone who's got a, yeah, a three, a four hundred thousand dollar home loan or a three thousand dollar insurance premium will receive more from us than they pay us. Which is good for the FDS, right? Which is great. So our FDS <laughs> says, look how much we paid you this year. Interesting. Um, so it turns your FDS into a marketing document. For sure. Um, it also creates a sense of, um, a greater sense of ownership, which is why we always talk about our members rather than clients or customers. Sure. Um, by joining the Life Sherpa tribe, you get all of these benefits. And it creates a much greater sense of community. Yeah. So that's really the journey. And then so through doing the exercise with the quiz, then they'll identify what they need to do to improve their score. Yeah. So obviously if I'm working my way through the exercises after spend less than you earn, um, you know, I'm gonna do I'm gonna I'm, well that that might be one of the answers, yeah. So but you're gonna start off doing some exercise, you're gonna do do the 30 day Track your spending. Um, yeah, try the seven day cash diet and you know, do all these little exercises. Yeah. And that might trigger. So actually, I do need a bit of help with this. Mm. So why don't I sign up for the course? Um, or if I'm working through prepare for the unexpected, you learn what income protection is and realize how that that is, is probably the one piece of insurance you really should have. Yeah. And that will then trigger a m- online meeting with their advisor. Sure. So that's the, the process. Um, and that obviously, but the key, I guess, the key that is that you're, acqu- you're acquiring a customer not when they're in the transaction mode today, which is expensive. So trying, yes. to, so trying to use Google AdWords to find someone who wants a home loan today or an insurance policy that's today yeah. is hugely expensive. Yeah. Like we're talking $70, $80 clicks. Mm. And you, and to be clear, you, most of your clients are acquired online through paid online advertising. Almost all. Um, I mean, some of them are organic online, but, you know, the primary member acquisition strategy is online. And that primarily means Facebook because we can't identify intent. So if you want, someone wants a home loan today, Google's where you go because Google's got intent because they're Googling you know, mortgage, yeah. mortgage broker near me or um, best home loan or mm. best online mortgage broker. Yeah. Um, and you know what they, but that's why they're expensive yes. because they're about to buy something um, that's yeah. worth three or $4,000 in commission to most brokers. Mm. So people are prepared to pay a lot of money and the big banks in particular are spending truckloads of money without real regard to the cost of acquisition because they're going to mm. sell them a ton of stuff over a lifetime. Yeah. So the cost of acquiring a home loan is sort of neither here nor there for the CBA. So we can't play that game. We can't outspend the CBA. No. So, <laughs> <laughs> so we focus on sort of the demographics and psychographics. So our 29-year-old advertising executive mm. Is on Facebook, she's on Instagram, and at least for now, at least for now, and she is. We know quite a lot about it. Mm. So, if we want to find someone who's just got engaged, 
Um, well, yeah. Facebook is the first person most people tell. <laughs> yeah. um, there's 120,000 weddings a year in Australia. If you go and look at audience insights on Facebook, there's 108,000 engaged women. <laughs> so you do the maths. There you go. Yeah, they're all, yes. Uh, well, mate, let me just say it's, it's good to see someone having some success on Facebook because I found that was a black hole for, for us in the business. And clearly uh, it's your whole thing and you, and you put a lot of... Uh, yeah, I mean, it takes a lot of time and you do need to have a presence there, but buying likes is not going to get you success on Facebook. Boosting, po- po- boosting posts is not going to get no. you success on Facebook. It'll get you likes. Yeah, but likes don't pay the bills. Absolutely. Um, so you mentioned lead magnets earlier. Um, you've got to give some value. Yeah. Uh, with a view to capturing, a, you know, for us it's it's largely um, email and mobile phone numbers. Um, we think we should be looking at messenger, but that's probably a a, a, yeah, a challenge for next year. Yeah. Um, and so you've got to give some value in order for them to give you that and not just give you a cruddy email. You've got to be delivering them some value. Yeah. And, um, you yeah, that might be an ebook, It might be a free course. It might be a yeah, 30-day free trial. There's a whole bunch of stuff that you can give. So with social, it's called social for a reason, and it's about giving before asking. Yeah. And you can't just put an ad on Facebook and say, yeah, come and buy my SOA. It ain't going <laughs> to happen. Mean? What do you mean? Do it, it, it's just not going to happen. Yeah. Um, and trying to do it organically is pretty hard. Um, yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. that's what we do. We just I mean, you, you, guys, you guys have got a lot of likes. I mean, your followers on Insta on, on, mm. and Facebook probably to a lesser extent, but certainly on Insta, I think yeah. you probably have more than anyone else in the XY group. Uh, Clay Clay had more on his pay on the Fun Your Ideal Lifestyle page for a bit. But, again, it's the engagement. Mm-hmm. It, we, we're not really seeing peak engagement. I'm getting a lot more engagement on LinkedIn. I find that to be a lot more effective for us in our business. Um, but in Facebook, I wasted heaps of time. Instagram, uh, spent, uh, that was like a good six-month play, and I uh, sort of we were <laughs> sort of going neck to neck with that and trying things out. But uh, tricky to do. But, mate, look. Uh, as I say, I, I, we could go right down the rabbit hole there, but uh, I, I want to stick with the planning mm-hmm. um, of your business because when I think of that, you say it sort of nonchalantly, but uh, this is a pretty, you know, and especially at, at that time, it, uh, fairly, well, even still, it's a it's a pretty revolutionary sort of model. So when you think about that that journey, and I'm going to charge someone 15 bucks a month, and then I'm going to opt them in and rebate the premiums and um, you know, end up net positive income from us and give them the education and, and drive everything efficiently and have a coaching and Q&A. Mm. Where did the inspiration from this, for this uh, set up, where did, they, where did it come from? Um, the original spark that um, turned the paper algorithm to a concept for a business came from a, a – um, I went to Innovate in New York in 2000. And 13, I think, mm. and I saw a business called LearnVest. Oh, yeah. And um, uh, a woman called Alexa Von Tobel. And she was starting an online business. Admittedly, she raised $99 million to do it. Um, mm. We've done it on less than one. <laughs> no, just over, just over one. Um, and that was the concept of offering a CFP service on subscription online. And it was, well, sorry, she actually started with an online content business. So she and the CFP subscription sort of came out of that. Um, And in 2013, this was a revelation. Now, the US is very much a different business to us. Um, You know, more people have money that they control because the 401k is more of a portable self-directed thing than our arm's length super and people have to sort of opt into it. Mm. Um, and there was another business around the same time called Nestwise, which was owned by LPL, which is one of the big de- um, broker dealer groups in the US. Right. And they were both trying to do the same thing. Um, 
And they kept slipping back to the investment advice. And it just hit me that actually financial advice is not synonymous with investment advice. Yes. And that was that was a really strange revelation because I'd come at this, you know, I'd, I'd come from corporate investment banking, yeah. funds management, at traditional, well, I'll try, we were running MDAs in 2003 in my previous business. Mm. So we ran, you know, actually a stock picking funds management exercise. And so financial advice was always synonymous with investment advice. It's always investment advice or product advice. Yeah, right? and you pick up professional planner or you pick up any of these magazines it's all about funds management and uh, assets under management mm. and fua yeah i was just reading i was just reading an article today where they were saying that uh that the value of advice and they were saying that the, an advisor adds uh 4.4 percent on uh their clients you know, i'm just going what is that measured on you know like if i would think about our clients the clients of our business and look at the, like, one, the assets under management are, you know, well, they're, they're a range, you know, mm-hmm. anywhere up to, we've got clients with $50 million, but um, it, for a lot of clients, for probably, you know, half of our clients, they've got, as you say, they're probably not not a million miles away from that $100,000 mm-hmm. or, or less. Then definitely a third of our clients would have less than 100 grand outside of super. And it's it's really about we're helping them get the 100 grand mm-hmm. or get over that or yeah. buy the first home and that sort of stuff. Or pay off the hundred thousand dollars of debt. <laughs> yeah, yeah, a couple of those as well. So uh, to say that someone that we had that to bring the value of advice back to a metric that we do on assets under management, I think it's just nonsense. Vanguard have published these white papers arguing just over three percent. Yeah, I've seen that time. one. I've seen that one as well. Very good presentation. Love Vanguard, yeah. but again, ridiculous. Yeah, I, and it probably does make sense if you're talking about investment management. Yes. Um, just getting the client to keep their hands off of it probably does add three percent. Um, and but yeah, we'd like yeah. more than three percent, I'd say. But you know, you come <laughs> so having seen Nestwise and Learnvest, and that was when Robo Vice, you know, people like Wealthfront and Betterment were starting to make a bit of noise. Mm. And I just kept going, this is all about investment advice. That's actually not what this group of people needs. And it took me months to really mm. convince myself that this heresy could possibly be true. Because mm. what do we do? We talk about investment advisors, broker yeah. dealers, dealer groups. Where does that talk about behavior? Where does it talk about psychology? Where does it talk yeah. about values? We just don't do it as an industry. And so having had that realization that then was the spark that said, okay, now I can take this algorithm and turn that into a business. Still didn't work out how I was going to make money out of it. <laughs> um, and I hawked this rant, this idea around all the VCs in town I could find in sort of 2013. Yeah. And to a man, they said, you're crazy. <laughs> um, or to a woman, should I say, um, that everyone said, oh, you mean robo-advice? And I went, No. This is not rubber advice. It's not about investment advice. Yeah. 60% of the revenue in this industry comes from non-investment advice. Yeah. Let me yeah. say that again. That's 60% of the fees and commissions paid by Australian consumers is for financial advice that's not investment related. Yeah. And where's all the money being invested in advice? It's about funds management. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and we don't track FUA in our business. It's not a metric that we look at. Yeah. I can tell you it's probably less than five million, but yeah, it's just it's a meaningless measure in our business. Yeah, well, assets under management is fair, but funds under advice is so much more when you consider properties and you know the broader yeah. broader investment. Yeah. Not that we're advising directly on yeah. the property, but it's on the personal yeah. overall asset. Yeah. But it's not a metric that we even measure. Yes. Um, but so that that led to the the idea that well now that's what I need to do. Now how do I deliver that? And the first place you look is, well, how do I get my cost to serve down? And there's a fair bit of tech happening around getting your service down. So, you know, improvements in advice software, improvements in CRMs, um, calculators, all those sort of things. A lot of people spending a lot of time and effort in that sort of 
efficiency space. The efficiency space. But being the most efficient provider of a service that nobody wants is not really a way to success. Absolutely. Um, yeah. And I don't want to get too far into it, but your your run um, conga via sales force, yeah. build your own sales force. Yeah. So, so, so I was pretty confident we could, we didn't spend too much time at that point, but I was pretty confident we could get the cost of service bit down. What we needed to do is get the acquisition cost down because that was the bit that was going to kill every fintech that you can think of is the thing that drives your success is can you find them at the right price and keep them for long enough? And but how did you how did you figure then if you to create the service that was compelling to to get it? Because acquisition the acquisition is great. Get the message to the masses, but if you've got a shit message, like you say, that's no right. One, yeah, no one's going to share. So, that. so the the message then was around um, that. Everybody can benefit from a financial plan. Everyone deserves to live life free of financial stress. And the key to removal of stress is control. And how do you get control? Well, you start with education. And just by the way, you need a shirt that you got. <laughs> yeah, of course. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so, so that led to the, well, what is this early engagement piece? There's no point in us telling people that BHP went up today because they're just not interested. I agree. Um, or that the RBA increased the rates again today. So we needed something that was tied into lifestyle, and we weren't going to be telling 29-year-olds to give up their morning coffee mm. um, or to stop eating smashed avocado, although this does predate the the <laughs> article that triggered that. Yes. It's all. Um, so we needed to develop a – I felt that the most important thing we could do was to get people engaged with their money. And that's about tying it to life. So I'd always maintain that nobody has financial goals. Financial goals are an outcome of a life goal. Yeah. So you've got to like a method to get to a yeah. life goal. So if, you know, if your life goal is I want to start a yoga studio, well, what are you got to do? Well, you've got to, Know something about go yoga. Work, go work for Atlassian. <laughs> um, <laughs> Make a couple of meals. That's a, so, a yoga studio clients come from. <laughs> and there's obviously a the financial thing. You've got to be able to lease studio. You've got to be able to buy some equipment. You've got to feed yourself while you're finding customers. And that's where the finance comes in. But you've got to get the lifestyle bit first. For sure. And link that back to, well, you can actually get more of that by doing this smarter. Yeah. And that really brings you to education. And of course, YouTube, the internet is full of video. So if oh, there's yeah. anything. I've got 84 subscribers, baby. Oh, <laughs> if, there's, if there's anything you want to do, you can just go to YouTube and find out how to do it. Mm. But what it doesn't do is deliver a journey. Yeah. So you've got to, so you've got to focus from, I am here. This is my position. I want to get here. But work out that where it is that you want to go, and we're going to create that journey. And that's really where the model started from. Um, why fifteen dollars? Who knows? Um, it was a it was a number, um, and um, the so having concluded that we needed to find people more cheaply, keep them for longer and serve them more cheaply and serve more of their needs, that then sort of helps you fill out what the service model needs mm -hmm. to be. Because you can obviously spend more to find them if you're going to keep them longer or service more of their needs. Yes. And that's why the banks can spend so much on client acquisition oh, yeah. because they're going to keep you for a very long time. Yeah. People don't move banks. Yeah. And they're going to sell you a credit card. They're going to sell you a home loan. They're going to drive you to their financial planner. Yeah. Um, they're going to sell you some credit insurance that doesn't work. Um, <laughs> it's true, Yang. Uh, we started an account with ING recently, and I've been with I've been with CBA for uh, all but three years of my life. And uh, Yang is like, oh, I'm going to move all my sick of pain, she's sick of pain, and these with CBA. So she wants to move to ING, and I just started getting deep anxiety. I was like, no, I was like, I'm not. I can't. Uh, I've been with yeah. them for so long. Not that they look after me at all, but um. it's just a pain. Yes, I mean, I've, I've had a 
and now Bacant ever since I took out my first home in London, Australia. Yeah. And the only reason I moved from what became St. George, I, I started here with Barclays. When I arrived in Australia, um, Barclays had a private bank here. And my Barclays bank manager in London said, oh, you're going to Sydney. You'll need a bank account. So when I got off the plane, I just walked into the branch mm. and my checkbook, credit card was all yeah. waiting for me. Mate, you are showing your age there talking and, about checkbooks. <laughs> and, and then St. George bought it and stuffed it. Yeah. Completely destroyed that business. And I moved to NAMP and took out my first home loan. And I still have that bank account. Yeah. Yeah, it's a weird thing. Um, so, getting back to the the point about um, uh, that, you need to have a sort of a long lifetime value for the customer, which means keeping them longer, which is about engagement, and that's partly where the and we wanted to be fixed fee, and that's partly where the rebate came from. So we said, well, it's actually a more engaging process to particularly for insurance where you, instead of saying, um, look, we'll dial down the fee and you pay us $1,500 plus, mm. plus $300 or $400 a year or whatever the number you choose. We charge $2,200 plus yes. Yeah, so whatever. And, yeah. It's only, and, you, and we, only charge, we only can charge that because you're, if you're paying us that, you're already paying us $5,000 yeah. a year to be on an ongoing service retainer at least. So... That's a one-way exchange that the customer is always paying you. Mm. Whereas if you turn that around and go, well, let's leave the commission where it is. We'll take our fixed fee so we don't have all the apparent conflicts around commissions. So we don't get paid more if your premium's higher. We don't get paid more if you go to one insurer over another, although Lyft is sort of fixing that problem anyway. Um, so we can put our hands on it and go, look, we get paid the same no matter how much you borrow or how much you pay or who you buy it from. But by deducting, we well, can't turn off common home loans for a start, but you can on insurance. So by taking the commission and rebating the excess, we're now putting money in their bank account every month. And that's a powerful reminder that every month you're getting value. You're getting some value. Yeah. I love that. And I, 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 I wonder to myself if the, if the model would work with that without that conflict being removed because I, I know that like when I started my business just coming out to four years ago, previous to that we were doing commission insurance advice because I was an employee and I couldn't get the I couldn't get it over the line to not do commission advice. My advice hasn't changed, but I've noticed that the confidence of people getting my advice has changed massively. Our engagement rates have increased enormously because I'm just going, well here I'm going to educate you like sort of like what you're yeah. doing. And then saying, what do you want? What do you want to buy? You tell me. It doesn't. There's no financial motivation to me. You're going to do something or not. Mm-hmm. If you choose to do something, you're going to pay me X. And then you cho- you then you choose what you choose. The income exactly. That's the most important. And if that's all, I'm going to tell you that there's a risk, but you make the call exactly. And you um, do it. And I think I wonder with just with that mass engagement, like you're going out to the public if. The conflict did exist. I wonder, do you think you would get the same, the same traction? Well, I guess I'm spending a lot of money putting my money where my mouth is on that. Um, I think, I think you're right. I don't really have the data to prove it, but my yeah. gut feel was, um, that fixed fees were the way to go, but asking people to write a check, particularly for, insurance advice was a harder exercise Mm. and there's also a a gst leakage by doing it Mm -hmm. um which again was one of those heresies i thought this can't possibly be right and i spent months running around in circles going is this really right um but there so to get your 2200 you got to charge 2200 plus gst Mm -hmm. but they're not registered for gst whereas if you take the money from the insurance company which is grossed up for gst yeah and hand it back, there's only one set of GST. Yeah. Which is bizarre. Um, but it was that two way exchange of cash that you, you, it, once you're a member, you have your Sherpa and you get entitled to these rebates. So it's about that sense of community as well. Mm. But it does allow us to put our hands on our heart and go, we don't care how much you buy or who you buy it from. We get paid the same. Love it. We're still not allowed to call it independent. Of course not. Corporations no. act. 
Whereas, in fact, if we did exactly the same thing and rebate the commissions and charge them the money, that's independent. Yeah. Whereas, because it passes through our bank account, we're not. Yeah, it's a funny. It's thing. just a. Oh, many more the GST. Yeah. <laughs> so, so yeah, that was the important part of the longer term retention because you've got to, and this is even more important with home loans because you can't die down the con. And, um, and they don't have independent mortgage workers. Well, there's a handful, um, but they charge a 0.65% fee. So I'm not quite sure what the difference mm. between handing back 0.65% of the commission and charging a 0.65% fee. I'm not quite sure how that changes the dynamic. Mm. But setting that aside, um, again, with home loans, as a broker, the biggest risk to your ongoing relationship is two years after they buy the house, they want to upgrade the kitchen. And they walk into their branch and go, I need another $30,000 for a kitchen. And, of course, the bank will rewrite the loan and your trail stops. Yeah. Whereas if you're writing a check to someone every month, that's a figurative check. We don't actually write checks. Yes. Um, that there's a the member now has an incentive to protect their own rebate. Yes. Because if they go into their branch, they're going to lose their rebate. Ah, I like that. So, I never thought about that. It's very good. So it's a... Um, so that, so you then do all of the... You do all of the, the re... Like the, the upgrades. Do you charge a fee if they want 30 grand for the kitchen? How does that no. work? Because that's not well, how it work, right? Um, no, we won't charge for that. Okay. But I suppose you could actually travel, which yeah. is arguably is, uh, is even more valuable. Yeah. Right? Um, or, you know, moving from fixed to variable or... You know, moving uh, when your fixed rate expires. So all that work, yeah. you don't really get paid for. Yeah. Um, and, of course, you have to stay a member. <laughs> um, oh, it's, it's 40% of the fees in the industry, so you can't ignore it. And, yeah. it, and it's 90% of household wealth. So 90% of Australian household wealth is in real estate. Yes. Now, I'm not saying that's prudent, but that's the fact. Mm. And with every property comes a loan. So it's a much bigger part of the revenue pool than mm. non-super investment advice. Yeah. So if you're going to do holistic advice, you sort of have to be there. And so how do we make that call then? Because the, I, I think, well, there are bigger businesses that, that normally you have to sort of be a bigger business to do it well. I know a few mortgage brokers like trying to do mortgage broking and advice, especially a smaller shop that really struggle to... Uh, to find the line and to be able to do that successfully as well. So what was yeah. so was it just a financial motivation? Or um, no, it was my view that particularly if you look at the cohort we're dealing with, that is the biggest transaction you're going to do. Mm. Um, and getting that family home is one of the biggest early goals. So if you're not there to help with that, you're not really a financial advisor. Mm. But you could partner with them all. You could. So that's what we do. We're but there for that but then you start saying, well, how do I, and there's a few people who do this really well, but how do I maintain the brand experience mm. between when I'm, all, all I'm really doing is sharing an office with someone. So they Well, not even that. It's even harder if you're yeah. not sharing. So it. there are some people who do it really well. Mm. Um, I think it's almost impossible to teach a mortgage broker to be a financial planner. It's not so hard the other way around. Yeah. Um, but if you focus on effectively a fee for service arrangement, forgetting how it actually gets paid for a moment. Yeah. Um, it becomes less of an eat what you kill and you can maintain that brand image. Yeah. And part of our thing is we have everyone in this chain is an employee. Yeah. And doesn't get remunerated based on volume. Yeah. Uh, so the book is the business of the book. The the Sherpa gets paid a salary plus bonus based on KPIs that n- none of which include sales volume. Right. Um, so so you're sort of attracting possibly a different entrant into the business. Yeah. So they're not people who see this as a stepping stone to building their own book. Um, which is historically how people went. I mean, the, historically, what you did was you you rocked up with your DFP and you you sat at a desk in the corner and were thrown a list of 
here's all the clients we haven't spoken to for the last two years, go call them all. Yeah. Or given a copy of the white pages. Yeah. And just call them. And great sales training. Um, not sure it helps with your financial planning ability. Yes. So, um, and of course, lead generation is far easier at scale than it is. I want to say your individual advisor, it's hard to spend the time and money you need to make online lead gen work. Yes. But as a business that works, it's but, yeah. easy. so so that's really so that was the, the the model was around saying, look, once you're a member, you get access to all of this stuff. And part of the deal is we give you back the the excess over the fair price for doing the deal. Mm-hmm. Which amounts to a fee for service, but you don't actually have to write a check. Yeah. And that that's part of ongoing engagement. So it protects you know, there's oh, a there's yeah, a there's monthly a there's a monthly reminder that you're there. <laughs> and um and it's a good reminder because it's money. And the FDS is then a well look, here's how much we paid you this year. Yeah. And um it's a it's a talking point. I can't remember is who who's talks about being remarkable. Um that if you're trying to build something, that is something that's different. Yes. And so it's the sort of thing people talk about at the barbecue. Yeah, yeah. Love it. And so um what's since you since you started, so it's been you know, kick, been kicking on hmm. for a little while. Uh what what has changed? What what's what's been the sort of the biggest changes since you've started? In the business, yeah, in your, um, in your service offerings, yeah. I mean, I think the the biggest change is the move from individual coaching to group coaching. So, our original budget, and this was largely driven by the cost of delivering the service. Yeah, our original budget program, our spending Sherpa program, yeah, is a two hundred and fifty dollar a month one on one service. Well, we do your banking in zero. Um, yeah, hugely expensive to deliver. Yes. Yes, yeah, so you've got $10 for zero cash book. You've got someone to actually post some transactions. And the average couple's got 250 transactions over 11 bank accounts. That takes a long time to reconcile every month. Yeah. And then you have a, you know, a, a regular catch up, which scales down to quarterly. It's just expensive to deliver and harder to scale. You just need more and more bodies. So moving to the Google Sheet. Thing and using Facebook closed group to deliver the live portion of that mm-hmm. um, has allowed us to turn that into a um, a more of a mass product. So moving from the personal trainer to the group coaching model. Yeah. So that's probably a big change. And when you see the new website next week, um, it will be much more journey focused. So. So when you sort of come to the homepage, it's more clear about, you know, if, if you've got a, if you just got married, here's where you start. If you've, oh, sorry, just got engaged, here's where you start. If you've got a budget problem, here's where you start. If you want a home loan, here's where you start. Right. So it's more, I think, finessing the delivery. Um, that's really changed. But no, looking back, if you go, if you compare life share for version 1.0 to, um, Version three, it's it is quite significantly different, but the actual changes are at the at the margins, but they do fundamentally change the the business. Yeah, but the core, the core, of the, the core hasn't changed. Yeah, the, the core being you know online education, triage, and guidance, backed up by a real human when you need them. So, sure. so dig, dig, digital now, human wow, we call it. Ooh, very good. Cool. And so I have to ask, uh, so you just, you've gone from 600 ish to 1.2 ish, which is, uh, which is huge yeah. for a business, especially at that, at, at that size, at that, that level. What do you, what do you attribute to that? Hmm. It's re- I think it's about continuing to do what we do and continuing to refine it every day. Um, and people realizing that once they've tried it, they tell all their friends. Um, so that should hopefully reduce our cost of acquisition over time. But, um, you yeah, know, we continue to build out the systems. Um, you know, when we launched, the front end looked really good, but the back end was still, 
No. There was a lot of no. lot of duct a lot of duct tape in the back <laughs> background, which is I now being it. which is now being tidied up. So our entire back end is built on a Salesforce yeah. platform. Um which, you know, when we started was a a very expensive luxury. Mm. Um, you know, when you've got three people in your database, um yeah. Salesforce is a serious overkill. Yeah. Um, but it has built a foundation that we now can just add little functionality every every year uh, every month so one of the things that's coming in this release is um capturing a validated mobile phone number on sign up okay so one of the big things we focused on was and i got a lot of kickback on this one and i'm still not sure is entirely the right answer but i was adamant we were not going to collect credit card numbers for the free trial you know how sometimes you sign yeah, up for a, yeah, you yeah, sign yeah, up for yeah, a free yeah. trial and they said, we'll give you a credit card. Yeah. I go, well, you're not going to need it until my 90-day trial's over. Um, and yeah. I think a lot of them rely on that inertia income because yeah. people just don't cancel it. Yeah. And I was adamant that we weren't going to do that, that for yeah. the the amount of pain it costs, like you think about the reaction, you, you you forget to cancel your 30-day trial and you get this bill. Yeah. Bastards, they've just charged me money. Yeah. Um, and I didn't want to be in that scene. and. Everyone in Digital Monk says, no, no, you've got to take the credit card to get yeah. it. So now what we're going to do is collect and validate a mobile phone number. So when you create your account, we'll send you a code to your phone, yeah. which you have to key in. So now we, we have a, a way of contacting you both by text, which has got much higher open rates, and yeah. also we can actually then engage you on the phone. So having seen where you've gone through your Freedom Factor quiz, we know what the – what your hot areas are, yeah, and we can actually now reach out and yeah, yeah, and talk to someone who's now engaged enough that they sort of know where they are, and now we can start from that point. So, yeah. you're, so you're having a well, how can we help you with your budget, or how can we help you with your whatever area they've got a particular weakness in? So that will that will help. And you're still not taking the credit card details. Correct. Good. I like it. I like the tenacity. Uh, That's it's, good. Um, it's just one of those things you go. Yeah, I agree. Should yeah. be engaged, and I think that's fantastic. I think yeah. that's. Uh, yeah, it's it's the it's been a a, a for my a big problem with the industry. This is why we have pre disclosure statements and opt ins. It's the same sort of thing. And if you're trying to fuck that training and yeah. more confidence, then. You're just doing it in another way, I think. Uh, yeah. So the two things everyone said that you can't do, one was not take credit cards at the beginning and the other one was rebate trails and home runs. Yeah. Everyone said you are out of your brain. Yeah. Um, and um, I think it's part of the – it's a fundamental part of the ethos that says we don't, we don't think variable commissions are good for anyone. Mm. And sure, everyone should get paid for doing the job that they do. Of course. But, you know, why should I get paid twice as much for doing a hub loan for someone in Surrey Hills than for someone in Pendle Hill? Mm. Just because they bought. Why get, why get paid double the commission on an insurance policy because someone at the last minute tells you that they don't disclose that they like to have a smoke yeah. when they're out on the weekends with their mates yeah. or that they've got, they have a high blood pressure and get yeah. 50% loading. So... Yeah, so there's a few of these things are probably a little heretical, but I think they're fundamental to that ethos that we're on we're on the side of the consumer. Yep, love it. And so tell me, uh, so is that hold on, just to wrap on that? Is that is that what you think it is? Just that the the ongoing that you're the, that you're in the consumer side and that you're um, that they're now more people are telling their mates or. Um, Obviously, we're getting better and spending more on the online acquisition. Yeah. Um, that, you know, as we've, as our revenue's gone up, we've increased our ad spend, yes. which is why we're still not profitable. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but we're getting close. So I think in 2020, we will turn a profit. So, but do you think for the last year, you've got 100% uplift in revenue? Do you, do you think that the main reason is the marketing spend? Is that the main driver? Yeah, I think it's it's about betting down a few of those things. It's about the seeds sowed in 2017, 2018, yeah. flowered in 2019. Um, yeah, you have an engagement with 
you know, so someone turns up for a 30 day free trial and they're not quite ready at that point. Yeah. Um, they come back six months later or they tell their mate who comes back yeah. and it just starts to create momentum. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I think our challenge for 2020 is going to be hiring. Yes. Yeah. Team, team is, a, is a big one. It's, uh, I think I've said this before, like I, when I started the business, I always thought it would be me, but you, you realise, well, obviously with your model, it would never work just being just you, no. but... Um, but yeah, I think that it's hard to run a successful and, you know, once you get to our level of success, then you really, if you don't have a great team, then, well, you don't have a, you don't, aren't able to grow a team, then you can't get your great message to more yeah. people and your great culture. And I must admit, after selling and closing down the previous business, we got to 17 staff at one point, nine of whom joined Yellow Brick Road. Mm. Um, I swore I would never go back to a team that size. And yeah. Based on the business model, yeah, we're less than two years away from that. Yeah. And it's a bit of a shock to the system. Mm. So tell me while we're on team, what's your what's the the best your top tip for uh, creating an epic team? I think it's all about culture and alignment. Um, you know, we we are. I mean, the way the business works, we're not really looking for you know, gun technical people with gun sales skills. You know, if you're, if you're a traditional financial advisor, and by traditional, I mean people who are, you know, 50 plus, mm. you know, what, what was important was how good you were at sales and converting the customer and forming the relationship with the, the client. And it was very much a relationship business. Mm. We're in the business of, Getting our members to form a relationship with the brand and the community. Yeah. And the, it doesn't, they shouldn't care who their individual advisor is. And that allows the, effectively stops that leakage of clients when advisors move on. Yeah. But that takes a certain mindset. So yeah. it's, it's a, you were looking for someone who's got coaching skills, someone with a lot of soft skills. Um, so our first hire came out of, out of a call center from one of the big insurers. Right. So qualified, they started to be qualified. So yes. qualified advisors. Yeah. Um, and obviously with, uh, Fazia, that's, um, more and more Man, qualified. It's a shit show at the moment. It's, uh, the same the guys I've got Luana in our team. She worked 10 years in the ATO in the, she's a qualified lawyer. Um, super like awesome technically. Hasn't done a thing. So now, and now, like, I was like, oh, okay, we'll, we'll have to start the professional year pain in the ass because it's going to be 12 months to, to go, uh, to, to, to get there. But beyond that, she can't even start the fucking professional year until she's done the, all of the phase year pre units of study. So now it's 18 months time and she's your gun. Like, well, yeah. What a joke. I understand that. I think that the educational thing is super, super, super important. And I don't want to take away from that in any way. You got someone that, that uh, has got all the technical skills that has got the soft skills and uh, ready to rock. It's like it's uh, it's a major impulse for, for yeah. an advice business. Well, I mean, if, I mean, I've been, you know, as everyone in XY Group knows, I'm probably the young, the oldest millennial in town, <laughs> and um, I've been around this game for a long time. I've got, I'm a chartered accountant. I've got an MBA, half a master's of tax. Um, what else have I got? Um, Cert four in a great year. <laughs> and I don't qualify. So come 2024, when I'll be 62, um, go on and just have to take that tax rate. I've got to go. I've got to go and do um, four units. Go sit in the corner. <laughs> just go sit in the corner. Maybe so, have to be to <laughs> so um, still haven't quite worked out whether you needed to be a responsible manager yet. Um, mm. But yeah, that's still some time away. But it's. That's sort of an aside in terms of saying, well, what are we really looking for? We're looking for soft skills that uh, systemizing and automation means that if I just have to follow the rules yeah, um, and the system will ensure they do follow the rules so that the same set of circumstances give you the same advice every time. Sure. It's not a one size fits all, but if you meet A, B, C, D and E, yeah, everyone who meets A, B, C, D and E should get the same piece of advice. 
And if you don't, there's a quality problem. Yes. But that's not how we've Any worked. System, right? Yeah. So we're looking for, obviously, people need to be qualified and licensed, but we're really looking for those coaching, yeah, it's sort of part tiger mum, part therapist, part no, coach. Yeah. Um, oh, and a little bit of technical skill. Yeah. And, of course, you still have to know your products. But you still have to follow the rules, no freelancing. Yeah. So different hunting ground. Mm. So, um, and, of course, you want someone who's not really seeing this as a stepping stone to building their own practice. So oh, this is how you add good value and... And not have the sales pressures. Yeah, like it. Cool, man. And so, uh, tell me one. I think you sort of you're talking about. I normally say like, what's one thing that that worked that you didn't think would, and one thing that didn't work that you think that you thought that you thought would. Um, I'm going to put the uh, not take the credit card details. <laughs> yeah, I think that that. Who knows whether it was important or not? Yeah. But it was something that was. It seemed intrinsically ethical to me that I didn't want to take fifteen dollars from someone when they didn't really mean to buy it. Yeah. So you get a few fifteen dollars, sure, but does does it leave the right taste in people's mouths? Can you honestly say we're on the side of the consumer and behave like that? I don't think you can. Yeah. Um, but I think one of the important points I think is knowing when to say no that when you've identified your ideal customer, know when to say no to customers that don't fit that criteria. Yes. Because they'll end up costing you money. You know, as a, you're starting up a new practice. Just that you mean to say no. Yeah. So, so start, so starting out a new practice, it's so tempting to just take anyone with a wallet and a mm-hmm. pulse who walks in the door. Mm-hmm. Um, but you know, our, to some extent, it's been self-selected. But if you've got a self-made super fund, you really don't belong as a life super member. Yes. If you've got half a million dollars to invest, you don't really belong in life super. If you've got a family trust or you run an incorporated business, you're not really for us. And we learned to, you know, we were adamant about saying no. Mm. You love the revenue, but yeah, they will just cause you trouble in the long run. But it does take huge amounts of discipline. And yes. uh, I mean, I've learned in the past that the ones you bend the rules for are the ones that you cause that cause most trouble. Yes, I totally agree. I had this conversation with Ray just the other day that we've got a you know a structured process for our for our prospect, mm-hmm. our new prospect engagement. And we find that people we've got this short questionnaire, which is really super easy. People can do it on the mm-hmm. couch on there with yep. you know one thumb in three minutes and probably less if they want to rush. But the ones that don't 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 do it, uh, and Ray Ray's newish in the business, so he's uh, he's more keys keen to mm-hmm. you know sort of get in front of more people. Uh, and he's, he's met it was a couple of times and let people through. But they're the people that are they're difficult to mm-hmm. they're, they're difficult ones to deal with. So I think you have to. You have to push them to either conform, or if they're not going to conform, then they're never going to be a great client, and then you just let them, yeah, let them go their way. But you know, it, it's such a hard yes lesson to learn. Yeah, um, and I think the one thing that really surprised us was the number of people we get who have been to see a bank planet and paid the six hundred bucks and not moved, gone ahead with it, mm. and they sort of say, "Well, I've got this piece of advice. What do you reckon?" So we do a surprising amount of business in second opinions on basis. In many cases, you know, the advice is not particularly wrong. Yeah. But it's not necessarily optimal and it's conflicted. You know, you, you see an you know, ANZ financial planner, it's almost always got one path insurance mm. and um, whatever the, in, uh, what's the investment platform called? Um, is it one path yeah, it might be one part. Um, or you get a CBA planner. Um, and they've usually been badgered to do it by their bank manager. Yeah. And yeah. Um, you can usually go, well, yeah, it's probably, it's not unsuitable, but here's a different way of doing it that's going to cost you a fraction of that price. Yeah. And, um, po- and probably leave you in a better position. Um, yeah, and I think that's probably 
that sort of behaviour is what's led the industry where it is. Mm. But in many ways, yeah. there's, there's never been a better time to be a financial planner. Oh, I was just saying it to, it's just chatting to Bo Riley from, uh, to, from Tal before mm-hmm. and uh, for me, and I, I would imagine for your business as well, the Barefoot Investor and the Royal Commission combined, yep. like that's that's uh, six figures of revenue for, for me in the last yeah. year because people are thinking about their money, they're aware of what shit advice is and they know how to work well. They at least know what they should be sort of looking out for to avoid. So if you're if you're client first, if you're ethical, if you're doing the right thing and you've got something that's compelling and engaging, yep. and I think it, the, your point yep. of being in that, that constant, never-ending improvement, hmm. I think. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, if you, if, if, if you try and think, um, you know, if I look back over 30-odd years in the industry, I think there's never been a better time to be a, a planner because there's more and more people in need of it and there's so much negative noise around it that a little bit of shine really makes you stick out. <laughs> and, you know, there's the all that. The is so low that just you just have to be a tiny bit good. And, yeah, uh, but there's all those advisors. There are all those advisors of my cohort, which I think is quite a big element in the group. I don't have you probably closer to the demographics than I am, but I would say that there is a significant chunk of advisors in, you know, mid to late 50s who are just not going to sign up for the new regime. Yeah. And um, and I also think that when the tide's sort of turning and when I think if we fast forward, you know, to uh, let's say, let's let's call it, uh, you know, phasing of plus six months, it, when we start to get, it's like you talk about that ground spell in your business mm-hmm. where people are getting, they're getting good help, they're in for a little bit and they tap out, it's not the right time, they're not committed or mm. something else happens and then they come back. When we can make all advice that great, then people, all, all, all advice just good, then people are going to be going, oh, yeah, actually, no, I need that. Yeah, I, okay, I, I, I know that this mm. is something that I need to do and this, I, it's avoiding some of the bullshit that I think that will have that snowball effect. I know, you know, the AFA guys and, and, and all of the industry participants more broadly talk about this class, the yeah, financial advice, 20% or 10% or 20% or whatever the thing is. But I think that what it will end up being is that people are, uh, when the advice is actually great, then that's what's going to push people. It's like if you see, you, you see someone that's like morbidly obese walking down the street, you go, shit, man, what are you doing? Like, get your shit together. Um, finance is a little bit harder because you don't wear it on the outside. Mm. But, uh, but I think there's the same sort of thing in you with people that you're close with. If you're being financially reckless and, you know, we want to get it to get to the point where people are going, what are you doing, man? Like, uh, you know, sort, sort it out. Go see someone, get, it, get your issue solved. And then if everyone's getting the right benefits, then... That's, that's all just going to be a snowball effect. Yeah, and I think we're on the cusp of you know, this, this really happening. If you go back to the 80s, 70s, 80s, financial advice was really product sales. Mm. And then we moved on in the sort of 90s to product sales dressed up a strategy. And now I think we're in the behaviour era. Yeah. So... You know, it's about, you know, once you can align values, goals, behaviour, now you get a real answer. And that's something that everyone can use no matter how much money they they have. Yeah, absolutely. It's what, it, it's what drives results. Mm. Strategy is great, great strategy is great on paper. Money on paper is great, like that's exciting, but it's the behaviour that translates it to the results. And I think that, you know, we... Um, uh, or like I won that award last year for best client mm. service advisor from the IFA magazines mm. that we've, uh, we've been fortunate enough to get nominated okay. again this mm. year. And a big part of that was about um, us getting results. And I, I'm like, well, that's great. Like I'm pumped to win that award. But holy shit, really? Like I, I'm winning an award because I get people results. Like what's the point of financial plan? Like I get excited when I do a financial plan, but the, really the reason the people want to see a financial plan and the, people, the reason the people get a financial plan is what your point was that they want the lifestyle goals, they mm. want to buy that property, they want to do that thing, they want to make that happen, they want to create that freedom and do all of the things. So plan on paper, awesome, but man, let's get some money. Like that's what, that's what it's about. Yeah, but it's also identifying what those outcomes are. So, and your point earlier about the Vanguard paper, um, 
if, you know, in my old business where our, I would say our USP, but one of the things we were saying, well, we can get you better returns, which is partly strategy, partly structure, mm. partly investment selection or stock selection. Um, making 1% or 2% more for the client a year is not an outcome that they talk about at the barbecue. No, and they don't know. And they don't know or care. Um, and um, whereas if you can align it with, you deliver an outcome that they want in their life, whether that's the house or the boat or the car or the mm. staying at home the with kids. your kids or whatever it is, um, that's something people will talk about mm. and everyone can benefit from that. You don't need a million dollars to invest to get that outcome. No. Um, so I think if we can keep that, your focus on what the consumer actually wants and it's not better returns. Yeah, it's it's yeah. Very confidence. Yeah, it's it's that you know. Um, you know, we we talk a lot about what is enough. When we say sure, enough in in life, is, it's not a number. Yeah, you know, it's enough money to sleep at night. It's mm. enough purpose to wake up in the morning, and it's enough joy to keep you through the day. Mm. And if we can deliver that, now we've got something. And the only way to do that is to align goals, values. And money. Yes. And behavior. Yeah. Yeah. That, mm. That's that's my view of the world anyway. So slightly off track, but what was uh, something that uh, that didn't work that you really thought would? I think the, the freemium model was one that sort of surprised me. So we went out with a LinkedIn type model. We said, you know, here's what you can have for free. Yeah. And then you can upgrade for $15, which every app has always done, you know, the yes. in-app purchases. Yeah, yeah. And um, it just didn't work. It was so hard to, when I say it didn't work, I mean, we did get customers, we did get people through the platform. People yeah. were doing stuff. We were doing insurance and homeowners. But the conversion at the end of that process from to try and get someone to upgrade from the free for life level to the $15 yeah. was a step too far. And then we just said, well, why don't we just do what Netflix do and see here, have it for 30 yeah. days. Yeah. And now they could actually know what they were going to get for their $15. Yeah. So if you're actually getting it, it's much easier to yeah. say, well, keep it. And in hindsight, you go, well, why didn't you think of that at the beginning? <laughs> like, we all have Netflix accounts. Why didn't we think of that? Um, but the freemium model was the thing. Yeah. yeah. There's so many products start off with a, you know, well, a lot of the tools we use in the business have a free level Yeah. and they try and upsell you. But getting it for free and actually doing it, mm. I think is a much easier exercise because people are much more concerned about losing stuff than getting stuff. Yeah. And also it probably gives them a time, just thinking about it probably gives them a time impetus to actually take action, whereas you sign up for this thing that's free for life forever. Money is one of those things that it's super important, but it's never really urgent. Yeah. So it's like, oh, yeah, I'll do that. Of course I can yeah. do that. I'll do that tomorrow. That's right. So what what is the midnight that makes you want to do it today? Yeah. 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 When, when you've been spending more than you earned for 10 years, mm. what's to – say that another week matters or another two weeks or mm. and eventually two weeks becomes six months, becomes a year, becomes five years. Yeah. And now you have the saddest event in a financial planner's life is when someone who's fifty five and has no money walks into your office and go, Yeah, I'm ten years from retirement. What can I do? Yeah. And yeah. Yeah. I used to see that all the time when I first thing in the industry I talk about it a little bit when we run our workshops when, you know, these days like to say twenty nine people that's and thirty, that's the thing. Uh, I see it 30, 35, 40, uh, big ones for us in the, in the business. But, yeah, we used to see people 50, 55, 60, 60 even had a couple and it's like, guys, like, you know, what are you, you're going to have to spend $20,000 a year now for the next mm. five years and you're still going to have a shit retirement. It's, uh, yeah, it becomes quite challenging. So. so I think, you know, if you can avoid those, yeah, I've seen quite a few of them in my time. You know, people walk into your office and, 
you know, well, I mean, time fixes most things when it comes to money, but you're starting to run out of time yeah. and you've got to start cutting your cloth unless you're prepared to accept that 80 is the new 60. Yeah. And yeah. You know, we're all, all bought off on 30 being the new 20, <laughs> but no one's yet ready for, uh, in fact, with all this fire movement, 40 is the new 60. I know. Um, yeah. And something's got to give. Yeah, agreed. Mate, uh, that's great. I honestly could, uh, could keep talking about this all day, but uh, tell me, what's your top tip for someone that's looking to either go out, plan a, a service proposition, fully overhaul their existing planning proposition or, or, or reshape their, their existing service offering, or trying to create their own sort of a, a approach within a, within a larger organisation? How can you create a compelling plan out a compelling service offer? I think you've got to start with who your customer is. Now, that may sound a little trite, but, you know, the difference between, um, you know, saying, well, we deal with millennials to we deal with 29-year-old female graphic designers with a spending problem. Mm. Now, I'm not suggesting that that's, that's a particularly profitable niche, but you've got to identify what it is that you are passionate about doing for a cohort that you can A, find, and B, is big enough to make whatever size business you want. Mm. Um, and so, like, and add tangible value yeah. beyond, like, they can afford to pay the key person influence program. They do this niche and thing. I can't remember the six ones. I've not spoken about this before, but it's like, you know, who can you help? Who do you enjoy working with? Who can afford to pay you? Mm-hmm. Um, I can't remember what the other ones are, but anyway, yeah. you, you sort of get the point where it's... But it's yeah. so, you, so you've got to find a group of a cohort that have some homogeneity about them and you have something that you can offer them. So whether that's a, you know... Um, yeah, you know, uh, the, the, there's, a, there's a very good practice around town that focuses on the needs of you know, young same-sex couples. Mm. But that's a that's a particular set of needs that most mainstream advisors are not across. Yeah, that's Jess. We have Jess and Glenn on the first. Oh, well, they've been in similar sort of. Sort of but yeah, podcast, they do a lot of yeah. So um, that wasn't who I was thinking of, but yes, that would be a good example of a well-identified that's niche. It. The problem having so much disposable income because you've got no kids and you've just got two French bulldogs. <laughs> well, it's funny you should say that. There's a whole bunch of research. I mean, this is getting a bit off track, but that childless couples don't accumulate any more assets than couples who are otherwise identical but have kids. Is that right? Mm. It, it just displaces. So the money you spend on the kids just displaces other spending. Replace it with assets. Yeah. <laughs> and, and having just added up how my, my boy just graduated from high school last year and I went back and added up how much I'd spent in school fees. Yeah. And um, it's a very, very large number. Yeah. Mm. And I go, well, what else could I have spent that on? Ecstasy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Probably wouldn't be where you are in this today, though. <laughs> 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 oh, mate, so yeah, I love that. I, I I talk to a lot of people about about their finances and uh, the uh, about sorry about their financial advice offer, and they you know I find that when people are so scattered with their uh, with their target market, like, really help. Oh, I help business owners and retirees, and but young people as well and accumulators. Mm-hmm. It's like how you know you talk about your website where you're launching. Oh, you're gonna have. Are you getting married? I don't know what your buttons yeah. are. Are you getting married? Are you buying your first home? Are you X Y Z? The reason you can do that is because you've got the 29 year old graphic yeah. designer with a spending problem. If you're the 29 year old graphic designer with a spending problem, plus a 35 year old engineer with a, not a spending problem, and, and the other thing, and the other thing, and the other mm. thing, it's, uh, it becomes impossible to hone that message. And I think that that beyond, yeah, hone your message, then streamline your service. Yes. And, and, uh, and make sure that that people. service meets the needs of that group. Um, you know, there's no point in being, if you want to do investment advice, you probably shouldn't be looking at millennial clients <laughs> because there ain't enough of them with enough money to make investment advice work. Yeah. Um, I mean, maybe wealth enhancers would make a reasonable business, but they're probably a bit more 
X than Y, I suspect. Mm. Um, but, you know, are, are you looking at aspirational yeah. 29-year-olds or, yeah. or bachelor family mm. 29-year-olds? You know, the difference between someone who got married and had kids in their early 20s at 29 is a different kind than, yes. than our, our graphic yes. designer. Yeah. And they need different things. Yeah. And what are they looking for? Yes. Or you, you, know, you want to help people retire early. This whole fire movement is becoming huge. Oh, I know. Don't get me started. My cousin, you know, my cousin's thirty-two, and he's he he works, makes one hundred fifty grand, very good at saving. He's got like two or three properties already before he got on fire, and now he's working his second job. And he's like, I'm like, man, just enjoy your life for God's sake. Like, what? Well, there's no way working. He works twelve hour days in his first job, and then goes and works four four to six hours in the night time. It's like. Already got, he's already doing well for, mm-hmm. for someone in the not even in the mid 30s. But well, I always tell the story that I've retired twice, yeah, and, and I think the longest I lasted was nine months, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just surrender. Well, it's true that I think, yeah, what do you if that's what I said to him? I'm gonna stop anyway. What are you gonna do? You go crazy or just lose your mind and then die, probably. So, but it is a huge deal, and yeah. There's a belief on the internet that Vanguard ETFs is the answer to to fire. Yeah, um, it may be part of the answer, um, but you know, just working your ass off and to get to 25 times whatever your income is in Vanguard funds is not a financial plan. <laughs> no, yes, you're right. Yeah, and it's, and it's again not making a, not ha- having to be a heavy side to make it happen. Yeah, and potentially freaking out like I saw this client put a bunch of money into Vanguard. Index fund. We use a lot of Vanguard yep. index funds. So totally. We Vanguard, but he did it at the wrong, but at a at a badish time at the back end of last year, and his money went right down, and then it came back up, and it made a couple of percent. And he was super stressed because he's like, "Holy crap, is that right or not?" It was right. It was perfect. Like he, he was, you know, there wouldn't have been anything that he should have done differently necessarily, but his confidence level is not non-existent because no, no idea. No, yeah. no and you see the opposite of that. You know, you put put it in into Vanguard, and it does really well for six months. And now they think they're investment legends. Yeah. <laughs> you know, actually, yeah. it's the market. That's what my clients thank me. And I, I jokingly say, I'm like, uh, you're welcome. Don't thank me. Thank the market. Also, don't blame me when it goes down. That's right. Um, Mr. Market. Yeah, that's it. Well, Mrs. Scully, thank you very much. A um, couple of quick ones, though, yep. on the way out. Your biggest oops moment or stuff up? Ooh. Um... I mean, I think the thing that got me closest to um, having to change my mind was how much money we'd spent on systems early on. Um, you know, we invested in, spent a lot of money on back office systems very early, and we probably could have deferred a lot of that. Um, but, you know, I don't, I don't know when you know when the right time is. Um, and I think that probably the other thing that took longer was trying to hawk this idea around town. Rather than just build it, um, you know, I spent six months in 2013 trying to convince every VC in town that this was the future of financial advice. Yeah, and to a man, they said, "No, you're dumb." Yeah, all <laughs> words that have well, "Don't call yeah. us, we'll call you." Yeah, and um, <laughs> um, back yourself. This one, I'm yeah, I think, yeah. Sort of um, and we we did have a bit of a, um, a hiccup on the hiring front. We hired a, a BDM to market our corporate plan. So we've got a cor- oh, yeah. an employer offer, which A, was the wrong hire, and B, was premature. Yes. And so that's, yeah. Foundations. Okay. So you, you, you quickly, you quickly. The biggest one, you give me three, <laughs> I get the point. <laughs> Best piece of advice you've ever received? Um. Again, I think it may sound a bit trite, but it is that thing about focusing on where you can do something that you really think is important and make sure that your beliefs are aligned with your customer. That if you try and do something that isn't aligned, you may make a lot of money, but you may not do it for very long. Yeah. And you know, in practice, this means you know, the number of times that we get people who Flog real estate, mm. saying, "Look, you've got all these millennials who want to oh, yeah. who want to be rent vesters. Yeah. How, how can we pay you 
six, seven, eight, nine percent. Yeah. Um, if you didn't have that alignment, that would be so tempting. Absolutely. And I think that one of the things, um, uh, Simon Bowen, who I've done a little bit of work with, and he does a lot of stuff around selling and sales models, that when you've got complete belief in your in, in your widget, it makes it really easy to sell the absolute shit mm. out of it because you can stand there with total confidence. And then when it, that gets backed up and, and validated with the data, then you can see that yeah. as well. So, so it's when you don't have that alignment, you do get, that's when compliance starts becoming a problem. Mm. Because if everyone's singing from the same hymn sheet and they're following the rules, there, there are usually no compliance problems. Yeah. So your costs disappear. People get you get compliance problems when incentives and culture are misaligned. Yeah. And that's yeah, the Royal Commission is a perfect example to all of that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, cool. What's your top technology tip or tech tool app? What's your? I mean, Salesforce is the is the core of our business. Um, it may not be pretty, it may not be particularly cheap, but it works in, and is imminently flexible. But I think the biggest lesson out of all of this is that you can't solve an analog problem with a digital solution. And by that, I mean, we as humans and our clients as yeah, fallible humans who have behaviour, who behave the way they behave for not entirely rational reasons, you can't deliver that answer purely digitally. You can use digital stuff to make it cheaper, make it more accessible, make it more exciting, make it stickier. Yeah. Um, technology is a huge part to play in it, but you know, don't try automating something that's not really automatable. Yeah. Focus on okay. use the tech where it's focus, yeah. It's use the tech good. where tech will deliver, mm. but don't use it as a substitute for actually talking to people. Sure, love it. And uh, productivity, productivity hack, top productivity hack avoid slack. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, that's, so it's a, being a bit facetious, but oh, um, they've got here these clowns in here. This is one level of the WeWork office. They've got their own Slack channel. It's like, well, if I want to talk to you, I'm just going to come and knock on your door. Yeah, we've got a Slack channel at, at Watso as well. Um, but you know, there is no substitute for tapping the guy next to you on the shoulder and going, "What do you reckon?" Yeah, we we don't do internal emails. We don't do reply all, yeah. Um, but it does mean that you you need systems so that all of that knowledge that's usually in an advisor's head, yeah, um, needs to be in the machine. Yeah, uh, I mean, a good example. Yesterday, I went to see this mortgage broker in town who um, he's got a very good first home buyer practice, and I actually hadn't put two and two together until. Halfway through the meeting, I realised that he was actually the guy that did my sister's home loan. Oh, right, yeah. And I said, you know, Scott, you, you did my sister's home loan. And he went, oh, that's right. And she's married to this Scottish guy and they bought in Balmain and, like, he knew. Mm. And this is a guy who writes $200 million of home loans a year. Yeah. And this was nine years ago. Yeah. Now... That's not possible at scale. I mean, two hundred million is a good, good. That's pretty scale, to me. yeah. Um, so, in terms of home loans, that's probably well, two hundred million is five hundred home loans, probably four hundred home loans a year. So, eight a week mm. over nine years is a yeah, you know, it's a reasonably sized broking business. But he was instantly able to recall that from his brain. Mm. Now that works when you've got a single man practice mm. because the client has a relationship with that person. But if you're trying to do this for 30,000 people, nobody can do that. And you need to make sure that when that, the guy who did the transaction disappears, that that knowledge is still there. Yeah. So getting this stuff in is critical. I don't know how you turn the void slack into that. But... Well, we use Salesforce as our core to, oh, yeah. to do that. Um, 
and that you know you've got to have the discipline to write the little note when you hang up the phone. Yeah. Um, yeah, we played with um, using GoToMeeting, which will do transcripts of meetings. Oh yeah, well, we use you red. It's a dollar. It's a dollar a minute, uh, but it's you know does its thing. There is. Um, uh, yeah, yeah well, a dollar a minute is adds up. It does add up. Yeah. Um, I don't know if you've tried Otter, which is gives you six hundred minutes a a month for free. Oh okay. Um, but it's not quite as accurate. Um, I, I, for our videos, um, I actually upload it to YouTube, then download the transcript from YouTube. Oh, I didn't realize that's an option. Yeah. Still paying on Earth. I yeah. this bloke in Bangladesh doing my subtitles for me, but I'm paying someone to manage that. So. And for, for me, and I don't know if it's just my accent, but YouTube gets yeah. it, gets it 99% right. Yeah. Sometimes it struggles with life sugar. <laughs> um, but, it's remarkably accurate. Yeah. And uh, so I do that. If I'm going to, if I go and attend a webinar, I'll record the webinar in OBS, mm. upload the video, and then download the transcript. Blog content for a And it's, um, <laughs> it's all there in the library of education yeah. material. Yeah. Love it. It just works really well. There's a few, you, there's a bit of hacking you've got to do in Excel to make it work. Mm. And, um, Cut out the the page breaks. Um, I can't. There's I think it's called Text Converter. There's a website that you can cut and paste in a piece of text, and it strips out all the line breaks and paragraph breaks, oh, yeah. and just gives you the block of text. Right, uh-huh. and it's all there. Interesting, mate. Uh, last question: mm-hmm. What's what's your spirit animal? My spirit animal um, is very good question. Um, I think if you ask my 19-year-old son, he'd say it was a platypus. <laughs> but I, I think I'd like something a bit more, um, a bit more exotic than that. Um, maybe a Staffordshire bull terrier. Oh, there you go, nice and specific. Uh, why a Staffordshire Bull Terrier on myself? Um, patience, tenacity, and tolerance, I think, is the, uh, is the, the key to success. And I think that's, um, that's uh, something I've developed over time. Mate, uh, yes, I think that definitely rings true with the, with the two retirements and, uh, and still pushing hard. Uh, mate, Thank you very much for for joining us. Uh, some some awesome awesome tips there. I literally could uh, keep talking all afternoon, but uh, might have to go have a baby. Yeah. Well, thanks for having me, Ben. I've uh, I won't be going back to join you in that that department. <laughs> <laughs> Cheers, mate. Thanks, Ben.